So you want me to kick it off now? Or wait yeah, go ahead and you can start introducing. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Sean Brenneman. I'm excited to, to be part of this. I know uh, Lake Washington Physical Therapy has been doing a lot here uh, real recently and trying to get uh, more education out there and more collaboration between uh, physical therapists and uh, other medical professions. And we are really, really excited uh, to welcome Dr. Ku today. He is a well-known shoulder expert in the area. I think uh, most PT circles, when we talk about uh, people who we uh, trust with uh, patients for shoulder issues, his name comes up. So that's pretty cool. And another thing that I, I think is really interesting about Dr. Ku is he's very uh, focused on that collaboration piece with patients and, and making sure that he takes time and uh, gives them the attention that they need to, to uh, be a partner with them in, in making decisions. And uh, uh, today, Dr. Ku is going to talk about some uh, shoulder arthritis, and I believe we're going to get to uh, talking about some joint replacements. So go ahead, Dr. Ku, and take it away. All right. Hey, thanks, Sean, for the kind words, and also Ben for this opportunity to kind of give this uh, and share this talk with you guys. So, you know, there are a lot of things to talk about in the shoulder, but today we're going to focus on talking about shoulder arthritis. And so shoulder arthritis is just uh, <clears throat> out there in the community, just like it is in the knees and hips. Um, shoulders a little bit different because it is a lot more complex joint. But we'll go ahead and, um, uh, you know, go and talk about this, if I can actually make this work. There you go. So um, education, obviously trained as an orthopedic surgeon, but my clinical practice and specialty is in shoulders. I don't do anything else. I only see shoulder patients. And in speaking about the shoulder anatomy compared to kind of other joints in the body like the knees or hips, shoulders are just an incredible joint, right? It, um, it, it has the ability to move in just about infinite directions. Um, the anatomy of the joint is also kind of interesting in that like compared to like the hip, which is also a ball and socket joint, in the hip, there's a lot of bony stability because the socket's deep and then the ball goes into the socket and allowing just the bony stability of the, uh, the hip uh, contributes a big part to the stability of the hip. Whereas in the shoulder, the, uh, the socket is very, very shallow. So if you can think of like a golf ball on a tee, the socket in the shoulder is like the golf tee. And so if anybody has uh, been golf, golfing before, you know that it's very easy to kind of knock that ball off the tee. And in the shoulder, there is not a lot of inherent bony stability. Most of the stability comes from the soft tissue structures that surround it. And, um, and therefore, uh, the kind of stuff that can go wrong tends to be soft tissue related um, or um, as in the case that we're talking about, just uh, related to the cartilage or arthritis. So what is arthritis? Arthritis um, is a, a hugely common problem um, in the orthopedic world. Um, so if you look at the statistics alone, there's been about a million joint replacement surgeries that are done in the hips and knees uh, as of last year, just yearly. So both hip and knee arthritis combined or replacement combined total a million. And that's thought to at least double in the next decade. Uh, for the shoulder, it's significantly lower. So there's about 60,000 being done every year. It's not an insignificant amount, but certainly it is less than um, the knee and hip counterparts. And what arthritis is, it's, it's a, a problem with the lining uh, uh, surface of the joint, which is called articular cartilage. And it's the part of the shoulder that allows for smooth articulation or motion between the two surfaces, between the ball and the socket. And when those surfaces either thin or go away completely, now you get bone on bone and that process is called arthritis. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. 
How do you diagnose it? X-rays are pretty commonly used for something like this. X-ray shows you bony structures. And if you look at this particular X-ray, it shows you the ball and the socket. And this is kind of how a normal shoulder X-ray should look like. There's good space in between. You can see that the ball is very smooth and well contoured. And versus where you see it in arthritis here um, on the picture on the left, you can see that the joint space is completely obliterated. You have huge bone spurs and deformation of the ball. And this is how you can tell whether you have arthritis or not. X-rays are a very useful tool in determining whether you have arthritis. So unlike um, other things in the shoulder, some of the more advanced imaging for arthritis include CT scans. Um, mostly in the shoulder, we are used to MRI scans or MRI um, arthrogram uh, scans because uh, MRIs are very adept and good at showing soft tissue structures. But when we want to look at the bone more closely, we tend to use the CT scans and helps us to actually look at the bone in a significantly more detailed manner. Although you can still use MRI for that as well, but the gold, gold standard is the CT scan. So those are some of the diagnostic uh, tests that are available to determine kind of what kind of arthritis, how bad it is uh, that you have. We'll kind of shift now to, okay, you have arthritis, now what do you do with it? How do you get better? You know, clearly the uh, issue is a prevalent one. It affects people's ability to sleep, uh, do things uh, on a daily basis, even just kind of reaching away, grabbing something, putting stuff over your head on a shelf, going to the bathroom, combing your hair. And um, <clears throat> there are uh, some short-term treatment options that uh, I'll talk about first, and they mainly are non-surgical. One is lifestyle changes, right? So if you are kind of uh, the type of person that's super active, uh, maybe particularly in weightlifting type of things, maybe just small changes there, uh, lifting less often um, or lifting uh, less heavy weights, uh, submaximal exertions on those type of things can make a big, big difference uh, for you. Physical therapy is another uh, big one that I, I suggest for people with arthritis. And mainly here, the focus is on range of motion. Um, with arthritis, particularly how this works is that there's a lot of force uh, inside the joint because the ball and socket are hitting against each other. And when the range of motion is more significantly limited, that causes more pain because it increases the joint forces. And then the more motion you're able to have, I think it decreases that force inside the shoulder. And so that's kind of what I've been um, mainly focused on with physical therapy. Medications. Um, that includes anti-inflammatories, things like Advil and uh, Aleve, those type of things. Different injections, uh, including cortisone injection. Although lately I have to say, I've been moving more and more away from cortisone injection because there's studies that suggest that uh, the use of cortisone um, in patients with shoulder arthritis, or in fact, anybody with uh, any type of shoulder issues in, uh, at all, um, there is a correlation between that and increasing infection rates around surgery and also failure of surgery um, if particularly you have surgery within a year. And so cortisone, I'm, again, it can be a valuable resource uh, to help manage some of this issue for the short term. But by and large, I'm trying to uh, look for other solutions if I can. The other option that people have is PRP or platelet-rich plasma, which I may talk about a little bit later. That's a more natural way to do it. Um, and I prefer the PRP in, in this particular setting um, for most people uh, if it comes, into, it comes to injections. So PRP, what is it? Uh, it's platelet-rich plasma. So essentially what we do is we draw blood from you, the patient, and uh, we put it through a centrifuge and we filter or centrifuge out um, the platelet uh, or the plasma uh, portion of it, which contains a lot of the um, healing substances um, that the blood has to offer. And we concentrate that and we inject it into the area uh, in question. 
um, it is still a uh, uh, you know investigative product, meaning there's still uh, uh, work to be done in terms of uh, validating it. And so, uh, in terms of insurance companies, uh, it's still not paid for, so it's a cash pay payment. And so that's the really kind of only negative uh, drawback that I see. Uh, but in terms of safety, it's entirely safe. It's your own stuff. It really couldn't be much safer as far as an injection goes. And it's been used for years. And there are studies that suggest that this can help uh, be helpful in a variety of conditions, including shoulder arthritis. Uh, it can be formulated in a lot of different ways. And so not all PRPs are the same. Uh, my preference for this PRP formulation is leukocyte poor which just means that the inflammatory cells are decreased in this formulation. Um, but again, PRP, I think, is not an unreasonable option for one of the non-operative ways to treat shoulder arthritis. So going on to some of the surgical ones now, if, if the non-operative stuff hasn't worked or if your arthritis is significant enough to warrant maybe surgical treatment, arthroscopy is, is a great way to go. It's a minimal, minimally invasive technique. You use high definition uh, cameras to get inside your shoulder and take a look. And these are kind of the views that you can see where you see the ball and the socket, and this is how it should look, where you have good cartilage lining, both the ball and the socket. And if you uh, take a look at what things look like when people have arthritis, that smooth lining is now filled with potholes. And in the lower screen, you see loose bodies within the joint from the cartilage that break down and now are floating within the joint. So essentially one of the things that you can do uh, is go and just clean it up. And by doing that, you help with the mechanical symptoms associated with um, fragments and loose bodies. It doesn't get rid of the arthritis, but again, it helps with the mechanical symptoms associated with it. So it can be a helpful uh, procedure for some people. Some of the more advanced techniques uh, for more difficult patients. So these are people, um, arthritic patients that are younger. So typically 30s to 40s. Um, if you're 30 to 40 years old or 45 or so, and really you just want to wait as long as you can prior to having a shoulder replacement, one of the arthroscopic techniques that I utilize is um, what we call an interpositional arthroplasty using a dermal allograft. Again, it's a mouthful, but basically the idea is I put <clears throat> this cadaver tissue and I sew it onto the socket as a cushion between the ball and socket. And this can all be done arthroscopically and it can buy people time as well, um, which can be invaluable, especially for the younger patient population group. I believe I may be the only person kind of in this area doing this. Um, maybe there's someone that's doing it now, but it is a little more te technically demanding uh, procedure. Um, but again, I've uh, had great success using this particular procedure for young patients, particularly like people like firefighters, uh, early uh, 40s, late 30s, um, uh, it, it provides an option in a very difficult situation. So now if you're talking, talking about long-term solutions, about getting rid of the arthritis, really the only option is a, a replacement of some sort. Just like people with knee and hip arthritis, once it gets to the end stages, really there's nothing you can do to get rid of it. No, no amount of arthroscopy or cleaning up is gonna make that go away. At some point, you really do need a, a, knee, a shoulder replacement. And there are two basic options. One is a primary total and a second is a reverse total shoulder replacement. And in general, these are very safe, reliable, effective solutions for people with arthritis. And so if you look at the literature, um, it shows you a very uh, positive um, outcome for most people, particularly with pain. So more than 90%, 95% of the people uh, find that their pain relief is very, very great. And also functional ability is improved in most patients as well, which is a fantastic thing. A primary total shoulder replacement is just as it sounds. We actually exchange the ball and the socket and you put the ball and socket where it needs to go, right? Where the socket is, you put a plastic socket where the ball is, you put a metal ball, and that is the primary total shoulder replacement. And this is what it looks like. 
Um, you can see the metal ball, the plastic socket, you don't see it because it's plastic, but that's also replaced. And in terms of who is eligible for total shoulder replacements, obviously if you have shoulder arthritis and you have um, uh, an intact rotator cuff, uh, a primary total shoulder can be a very good procedure for you. If you don't have those things, meaning if you have um, rotator cuff issues or other issues going inside the shoulder that preclude you from being able to be eligible for a primary, you'd be eligible for a reverse total shoulder replacement. And it sounds uh, just like it sounds, it's a reverse total shoulder. So whereas in the primary total shoulder, you put the ball where the ball is and the socket where the socket is, with the reverse total shoulder, you change the position. So where the socket is, you put the ball and where the ball is, you put the socket. Um, and the reason for doing something like this is because most commonly um, you, don't, uh, you don't have a functioning rotator cuff. And so this um, configuration of the prosthesis allows your body to actually raise up your arm and power your arm without the need for a rotator cuff. And for also uh, reverse whole shoulder replacements are used for revision cases or salvage cases where the primary has either failed or there's not enough bone stock uh, to do a primary. And so this is actually, even though it may sound a little bit more <clears throat> extreme compared to a primary total, it's an invaluable procedure that's used quite often now. Um, and uh, if you look at the total number of shoulder replacement being done, um, reverse total shoulders are actually performed more commonly than primary total shoulder replacements. Uh, in a ratio of about 60 to 40 percent. And so, as I just talked about, reverse total shoulder replacements, again, it's a new solution for difficult conditions. Before we had this technology, really people with these difficult conditions, as we talked about, people without rotator cuff functioning, people with bone loss, people with failed total shoulders in the past really didn't have much of a good solution. Now um, we have this to, um, as available. The surgery itself really doesn't take much longer. Uh, you know, they take about an hour, hour and a half to do. They are all done as an outpatient. And I would have to say, because the uh, configuration of the prosthesis uh, doesn't require, it does more for you for the body, the rehab tends to be quicker as well compared to even a regular total shoulder replacement. This is kind of what it looks like here. Um, again, it looks a little bit different, but again, where the socket is, you have the ball, and where the ball is, there's the socket. So, um, you know, an, an interesting thing about shoulder replacements is that if you look at the statistics, it's kind of uh, astounding that, you know, I was even shocked to kind of hear the statistic. 75% of shoulder replacements are done by and are performed by general orthopedic surgeons who only do one or two cases per year. And as most of you know, I mean, if there's a direct co correlation, just about everything in life, the more you do, the better you are at it. And that's certainly true of surgery as well. The more you do as a surgeon, the patients also do better. And so, you know, I, I would put a little plug in for um, shoulder specialists. If you're looking uh, for shoulder related issues and someone to help you with that, I would urge you to maybe just take a moment and seek out someone that specializes in the shoulder because I think that will help you um, uh, perhaps get a little bit more uh, better results uh, from uh, the procedure that you're looking uh, to get. Uh, I'll, let's, let me just kind of go into a little bit about what shoulder replacements kind of may look like um, in 2021. Um, they are no longer uh, inpatient procedures. Uh, almost all of these are done as an outpatient. Uh, starting in 2022, the, most of these will probably done, be done at, at an outpatient surgery center as well. Uh, as it stands now, though, most of these are done in a hospital setting, but as an outpatient procedure. You go home the same day. The surgery takes about an hour, an hour and a half to do. Uh, most of my patients are off of pain medications within about a week or so. And so the, uh, all the kind of modalities to help with pain management around the time of surgery have improved 
significantly where that's possible. Um, and the recovery takes about three to six months. Most patients will tell me that within the first week or two, they can already tell that the pain from the arthritis is gone. Obviously, they still have to recover from the actual surgical incisions uh, themselves, but uh, they are doing very well pretty quickly compared to even some of the other shoulder surgeries that we do, like rotator cuff surgery. And so uh, as far as shoulder replacements go, they tend to go fairly smoothly and they are significantly better today than they were even a few years ago. A few uh, last uh, things to consider uh, about shoulder uh, replacements. Um, you know, one of the most common questions I get answered is, okay, I have shoulder arthritis. When's the right time to do it? And I think for a lot of knee and, sh and hip arthritis patients, they're often told that you do it when you can't deal with it anymore, right? When the pain is so bad, when it bothers you to the extent you can't deal with it anymore, that's when you should actually have a hip or a knee replacement. And I'm here to tell you for the shoulder, I would maybe give a little bit of a different perspective. If you look at the outcomes after shoulder replacements, again, uh, looking at the studies, uh, people who are functionally better before shoulder surgery will do better after shoulder surgery, meaning the better range of motion that you have before surgery, typically the better range of motion you'll have after surgery. The converse is also true. If you're doing worse and the worse your shoulder is before a shoulder replacement, you'll also tend to have worse outcomes afterwards, meaning for those uh, who are considering shoulder surgery or shoulder replacement, my recommendation generally has been consider doing it a little bit early rather than be, being a little too late. I think that will help you improve your odds of having a successful and more functional shoulder after shoulder replacement. Uh, second thing is, you know, waiting can prevent the ability to do procedure itself. And as I told you already, the reverse shoulder replacement tends to be a more common operation now compared to a primary. Some of that is because if you wait too long in the shoulder, as the arthritis worsens, you tend to wear down the back part of the socket. And if you wear down the back part of the socket too much, it can uh, prevent the ability to actually perform a regular shoulder replacement. Um, and nowadays there are different augments and things like that you can do but that certainly complicates things. And again, waiting too long can have potentially negative consequences. So again, it comes back to kind of that, um, that advice there is that on, at least that pertains to shoulder replacement surgery, being on the side of a little bit early is better than being on the side a little too late. The big best proxy for that for you as a patient is probably just your range of motion the better your range of motion, probably the better your shoulder is doing. Um, and so the, the moment that it starts to worsen, that's probably when you should consider uh, a shoulder replacement. You know, we talked about this already, consider using a shoulder specialist for the reasons we talked about. You know, you're not gonna talk to a tax lawyer to talk, uh, you know, help you with your, you know, failing mar marriage. Uh, in the same way, you know, even among orthopedic surgeons, they're gonna people, that do a lot more shoulders than others, I suggest that they would be the people that you would look to to perform your shoulder replacement. In terms of longevity, how long will it last you? Um, you know, the best studies out there now suggest that at least for primary total shoulder replacements, um, there's a 90% survivorship at about 10 years, an 80% survivorship at about 20 years. And so the uh, <clears throat> longevities of these rival those of the hip and knees. Um, and, uh, and so uh, it's something that will likely last you a long time if you get it uh, done well. Lots of shoulder replacement devices um, and they're continually evolving. Um, and um, I will keep you up to date if there's anything new. Uh, the general direction has been for smaller implants and more bone sparing implants. Um, and obviously I use kind of a prosthesis that I feel works best for my patients. And so 
you know, in summary, uh, shoulder replacements, while not as common as knee and hip replacements, are common and getting more common. Um, and there are good ways to treat them, both non-surgically and surgically. Um, <clears throat> and if you do need surgery, um, there are certainly arthroscopic techniques that are there for maybe earlier stages of the disease. Um, if you choose a non-surgical injection, my uh, recommendation would be for a platelet-rich uh, plasma injection instead of cortisone injection. And uh, if you need surgery, consider a shoulder specialist. So at this, I'll kind of uh, uh, maybe leave some room for uh, questions. Uh, but thank you for uh, yeah, listening to what I have to say so far. All right. Um, as most of you know, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them in and uh, Dr. Ku will answer them for you. Uh, thanks for that, Dr. Ku. That was uh, really informative. I have a first question from Mike H. He says, uh, how does microfracture play in among the options that you mentioned? Yeah, so uh, microfracture is a specific technique that's more known in the knee. And essentially what my microfracture is, is if you have a problem with the cartilage and you have exposed bone um, because of that problem, um, and it, this is in a very specific group of people as well. It's not global arthritis, right? Where you have arthritis all throughout the joint is only if you have a problem with a certain area of your cartilage. So this typically is in younger patients with an injury. You can actually take like a drill and poke holes into that bone, stimulating he, uh, some of the bone marrow elements to come. And the idea is there is to uh, provide some healing or regrowth of some of the cartilage in that area. Um, this has been uh, you know, significantly more well studied in the knee in the shoulder, less so, particularly as a non weight bearing joint. It is still done in the shoulder in uh, certain instances. Um, and you do it in the same way. But again, the people that uh, would be eligible for it would be a very narrow set of uh, population, meaning it's typically younger patients uh, with a very focal lesion, not global arthritis. Great, uh, thank you. The uh, next question I have for you is uh, in reference to the, I think it was dermal allograft that you mentioned. Yeah. How much time would you usually quote uh, a patient that it, it could buy them from needing something a little bit uh, more aggressive? Yeah, so uh, the dermal allograft is again, um, a very uh, a specific operation for a very narrow subset of patients. And so as I talked about, um, it's younger patients with arthritis. And so by younger, I mean people in their late 30s, early 40s, even the mid 40s or so that are active. Um, the problem with doing a regular shoulder replacement in such a young population is that they're likely to wear it out a lot sooner because they tend to be more active. And so the idea is to buy them again some time prior to needing that. And so when I perform something like this, my hope is that I can buy them five years or something in that ballpark. Um, although I think I've, I personally had patients that have gone beyond that, um, but that's the idea. That's the kind of the ballpark in which I'm hoping to uh, buy some time for them. Great, thanks. Uh, another question from an attendee, how, uh, how do you decide or what do you typically do with the, the bicep tendon with a total shoulder replacement? Do you tendonomize or tenodice it? Yeah, so uh, almost, all, almost everybody that I know uh, doing a total shoulder replacement will do something with the biceps, either tenonomize or uh, tenodice the biceps. And the reason for that is the biceps is almost always involved in the disease process. Um, and will have significant pathology uh, when you're doing the replacement. Um, and so for me, if, if there's an opportunity to tenodice it, meaning to reattach the biceps um, in 
the kind of normal tension that the biceps sits in, I will almost always tina dece it. There's rarely ever a time where I will just tenotomize, which means just cut it and let it loose um, in the setting of a total shoulder. Great. Uh, another question related to the, the total shoulder and the reverse total total shoulder, excuse me. Uh, what are your uh, expected or, or your outcomes as far as range of motion, range of motion goes that you would say are, are a good or successful outcome for a patient? Yeah, so I alluded that to a little bit in my talk. And so, you know, your range of motion possibilities um, mirror kind of what you come in with. So if you have great range of motion before the surgery, the likelihood is that you're going to have great range of motion afterwards. The less range of motion you have before surgery, you're also likely to have less range of motion afterwards. Almost always, you will uh, your range of motion post-surgery or after surgery will be increased compared to where you came in. However, the, uh, the final result will often mirror kind of what you came in with. Um, and so uh, if you have horrible arthritis and you can barely raise your arm up at all, I think, it, uh, I think it's an unrealistic expectation to have a shoulder replacement regain all of that for you you'll improve. Um, however, um, if you're talking about functional range of motion, so the range of motion that you use on a daily basis, almost everybody, they'll see dramatic improvements in that. And the reason being that the shoulder replacement is very good at removing the pain associated with motion. So whatever motion that you do have, it tends to be very effective uh, because you're doing it without pain. Another question from Carla, do you ever use amniotic fluid injections? Uh, and do you have an opinion on the use uh, in the shoulder? Yeah, so lately there's a proliferation of stem cells um, of all kinds of different uh, um, origin um, that's in use out there. Um, you know, it, so I would say these biologic um, options so that includes PRP, which I talked about, um, going all the way to stem cells. Um, that's available for you know, patients that are out there. Out of them all, the PRP is, is the most well-studied, and there's a lot more um, papers on that compared to the stem cells. For me, for my comfort level, um, I, I just don't see enough data in the stem cells and that includes amniotic fluid to justify its cost at this time. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, if there's no other option and you're looking for something to do and, and you wanna spend a few thousand dollars on those things, I, I'm not gonna stop you. Um, however, I don't think the current literature would support the use of that. Um, um, for those kind of devices ju just yet, again, in my opinion. Um, for shoulder arthritis in particular though, I, I find that uh, PRP can be very effective uh, in the right setting. And so that's my preferred use. Um, and I do not, I have not recommended stem cell of any uh, type as of this time. Great. Uh, another question from an attendee. This is, this is a really interesting question. Is a total shoulder replacement possible for someone who permanently uses loft strand crutches? Okay, you know, I don't know what a loft strand crutch is. Those, yeah. those are the, the crutches where they have the uh, forearm brace and they, they grip them with their, um, oh, yeah, with yeah. their hand. So when you have uh, either a walker or crutches and you have to exert a lot of force into your shoulder, it does make it difficult. And so um, to have a total shoulder replacement, it's not impossible. Um, there are certain things uh, that we can do to try to help you kind of transition over. And particularly the hardest time is, in, is during the time of healing. Once it heals, it should work well for you. But again, that is a tricky part that you'd have to really work hard at getting over. And there needs to be some accommodation or help that you have that'll help you get through that time. Is it possible? Yes. It's not ideal, but if you're just suffering so much because of the shoulder arthritis, it's something that's possible. 
Great. Uh, along those lines, is there are there any activities that uh, that you just say absolutely no after a, a total shoulder or a reverse total shoulder? Yeah. So that's another great question, and I thought long and hard about this. And there's kind of lots of different. Um, Kind of protocols and do's and don'ts for total shoulder replacements uh, out there. Uh, my personal philosophy has always been, um, you know, the reason why people do this is so that they can actually enjoy their life again, right? And so I don't put any specific restrictions on anybody. However, um, I think it is important to know that shoulder replacements, they don't last forever. There is a shelf life to them. And just like your shoulder wore out to warrant a shoulder replacement, once you have a new shoulder replacement inside your own shoulder, it, uh, it also has a shelf life, so to speak. And typically the more you use it, the rougher you are on it, the faster it will wear out. And so just remember that. Um, and so do I, would I, you know, uh, recommend people go in and, you know, maxing out on the bench press after a shoulder replacement at what, three to 400 pounds? I, probably not, right? However, I mean, could you possibly do that? I mean, I think you could, I, I, but again, I think the, the downside is that you're likely gonna see that your shoulder replacement lasts um, a shorter amount of time for you. Great, and, and with that said, what, is it possible to have a, a second and a third? Is that is that in the cards if, if somebody does wear through their shoulder replacement? Yeah, and shoulder replacements do wear out, right? Or they fail for whatever reasons. And if they do, um, there is a possibility to revise it. It's not, um, as with any type of revision surgery, it's not an ideal situation. And if you can avoid it, it's better to avoid it. But if you'd have to have it, yes, it is possible to get it revised. What what would you recommend or what would you suggest would be the average lifespan of a, a well taken care of shoulder replacement? Yeah, I mean, if you are someone that gets their first shoulder replacement 65 or older, um, I think there's a very good chance that it'll last you a good 15, 20 years. Great. All right. I think... I think I've covered all the, the kind of shoulder specific questions. So unless someone writes in here anything last minute, I have one, uh, one final question for you. I think uh, these webinars get a lot of kind of younger physical therapists that, that like to get on and are hungry to learn as much as possible. So kind of a general question for you, Dr. Ku, is what kind of advice would you offer for you know, young clinicians that could be medical doctors or, or physical therapists as they are venturing out in their careers? Uh, as it relates to shoulder replacements? Uh, no, no, just uh, more, more so medicine and, and, and patient care, patient interaction, you know, anything that you, you maybe thought of that was a, a gem that you learned early on. Another thing I, I appreciate more than anything, I think it's just communication. Um, you know, it's like there's, a, you know, th there's so many different surgeons out there with kind of different ideas on how people kind of rehab. Um, I think it never hurts to over communicate. And uh, at least, you know, as it pertains to kind of my expectations on how things should be done. Um, and so I always appreciate that. Uh, when people kind of reach out and ask questions where appropriate, if there's, you know, something that's, you know, um, questionable or something that they don't understand about a particular procedure, if they reach out to me, I'm always happy to, you know, kind of discuss that with them. So I think that's number one. Um, you know, the worst thing that you want to hear from anything, any patient is to say, oh, you know, the, the therapist was so aggressive. The, you know, I feel like I, I ruined my shoulder just trying to uh, rehab it. That's the last thing you ever want to hear. And so I think over aggressiveness is not a great thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, personally, you know, given kind of the trajectory of my career, I'm sure even within physical therapy, in the physical therapy world, there are uh, people among you that also specialize in different joints, right? People who like knees better, uh, or the hips better, or the shoulders better. You know, uh, my preference has always been to send patients to 
therapist who also who enjoy the shoulder like I do, you know, and who are good at the shoulder as I do. And so I think that's also probably a possibility in the physical therapy world, right? To specialize a little bit, at least in that. Perfect. Uh, that's actually a great segue to our end. Is there, is there any way that, that you'd like to share that we could, you know, a therapist could reach out to you in the future for, for tips, tricks, or, or just communication uh, with patients or about yeah, patients? We're, we're always available by email. Um, uh, and, you know, I have um, a, a PA or a physician's assistant's um, our MA and, as, and our practice manager that are always available if I'm not um, to get a hold of on a daily basis to communicate whatever you need to us. Um, and we're typically pretty good about getting back to you all uh, uh, if there's uh, a need to do that. So um, yeah, we'll, like email, phone, any which way um, right. is good for us. Okay, I got, I got one final question. I don't want to miss it. Uh, Scott asks, when, when you say, Dr. Ku, a well taken care of shoulder, uh, what, what, do you, what do you mean by well taken care of? Mm. Not sure. I, I think mean. we were talking about, I think, in reference to a lifespan of the shoulder, you and I both referenced somebody that takes, uh, you know, has a well taken care of shoulder. Yeah, I think that's just kind of a general statement. I mean, again, there's no kind of one way that's going to work for everybody. If you avoid extremes, right? If you're not, again, as I think I mentioned, you know, weightlifting uh, really heavy amounts every day, as long as if you're using your arm for activities of daily living, it should work well. It doesn't mean that you can't go and play tennis. I think that's fine. Go play pickleball, go throw uh, a ball with your kids or grandkids, whatever it might be, those are all okay. Um, and so um, I, I think what I'm talking about is again, extreme behavior. And there are people who, who like doing that kind of stuff. And um, as long as you're kind of within kind of what you do in a daily, uh, daily basis, you should be okay. Great. I, th I think we covered it all. Um... Are you, I have a question here. Are, are you willing to share your email on, the, on this uh, broadcast? Are you willing for us to share a, an email for people to reach out to you? Or yeah, your team? yeah, I'll have uh, maybe Jennifer reach out to you guys and maybe we'll have a central uh, email that, that you guys can all reach out to um, so that we can make sure that it's uh, responded to in an appropriate uh, time, timeline and manner. Perfect. Uh, sounds like that that has us covered then. Great. Well, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks a lot, Sean. All right. Thank you, Dr. Koo. Yeah, take care. Bye.